Welcome to the show, guys. Um, hope you're all having a beautiful day. It's beautiful outside here in sunny California. We're in Southern California, that is. Um, I don't know what it's like where you're at, but uh, the sun's out. Spring's definitely starting to happen. Um, I'm sure people are going to be taking long walks today since they can't do much else. Walk down to the beach. So uh, with that said, um, we've got an exciting interview for you today. Um, Mike is here with us, and uh, Mike's been around for many years. And when I first met Mike, let me see, that was about, how long ago was that, Mike? Five years ago? Uh, I think uh, six, six or seven almost, actually. Seven years ago, yeah. yeah. The Mike um, uh, basically, you know, he had a lot going on. You were very, very reactive individuals, what I remember. I remember you, everything bothered you everything upset you, everything went wrong. And you would be, you would be calling us in the middle of the night trying to, ah, oh, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what about this. Ah, you were so reactive and it had, and that was one of the key things we had to work on was getting you to stop thinking that everything was wrong and everything was going to go bad and everything was going to fall apart. I remember that, that, that negative self-talk. Yeah. On top of that, you have a disability and you, that disability challenged you. You have, um, you had several strokes as a child. Is that correct? Two. Yeah. yeah two strokes. And, um, and so you grew up with this disability. And what I remember uh, it was there was this heavy sense of, of almost like a, a victim mentality that you were projecting out of the world. And, and, um, and as we began to work with you and you began to see more and more that you're not a victim, that you have power, you can take control of your life, the disabilities don't matter, that everybody's got something that holds them back. Man, have you showed up. And Mike has really changed his life from building that body that he's always wanted, getting his six-pack abs, to dating the women of his dreams, to now dating a, one of your dreams. You wrote down was to you wrote it down, I think, somewhere, and it was to date a porn star. And now you're dating a porn star, um, yeah. and you're having an amazing. You have the, the car of your dreams. You have the life of your dreams. You live in Hollywood. He, this guy's party central. You know, he loves his parties, but he's he's really. And I remember the other thing is he used to live on rock stars, energy drinks, and and crappy food. And now you yeah. eat super healthy, you take care of your body, you've cleaned all that up, for, you know, and that's just a reflection of your mindset. It's a reflection of who you are inside and who you're becoming. And, and um, now he works for us and I'm seeing, uh, seeing in the business, I'm seeing more and more self-control, focus, solution orientation, all the stuff we talk about. So the question I have is how many breakdown to breakthroughs did you have to go through to get to where you're at? <laughs> oh man. That's a good question. A lot, a lot, dozens. I mean, dozens, if not a hundred. So, mm. yeah. And that's awesome. So, Mike, let's, let's share a little bit. Tell us, tell us your story um, about uh, basically, you know, how you, your story up to the point of fearless. What was your life like? What got you to fearless? What, what brought you to that point to, and to work on your dating? And I know you'd worked with some other dating companies and some stuff came up. And so kind of talk about all that really quick. Yeah, well, when I was young, even after, you know, the strokes happened so young that I don't remember life before them, but um, I was still a pretty outgoing guy when I was a little boy. You know, my mom even tells the story of me sitting in an airport, and just instinctively, I was sitting next to some cute 20-something, and I just did what we should all do a lot more, right, which is just put my hand right where, right there and, like, started massaging her leg. I was so confident and just was like, I like this girl. I want to touch her. And um, obviously you gotta be careful about that as an adult. But the point is I was very outgoing, charming, um, would talk to adults, got along with everyone. Some point in high school though, maybe junior high, uh, as kids started dating and uh, flirting and that kind of thing, um, that confidence definitely faltered. Um, and I was also raised mostly by my mom. My dad was unfortunately mentally ill, so he was, he was there for me as much as he could, but I just didn't have that much of a masculine figure in my life. Um, so my mom was very sensitive and taught me never to make fun of anyone. No joke was funny unless everybody thought it was funny. So I was just very walking on eggshells with people. I never wanted to insult anyone or hurt anyone's feelings and um, just be hyper nice guy. I was so nice in high school that uh, at one point, I bought things for people I didn't even like just to try and get them to like me. Um, just to give you kind of the picture of how much of a nice guy I was and just no masculinity. 
so no dating life in high school or college, um, which got pretty painful in college, you know. I was also in therapy in high school and a little bit of college. And um, certainly it's great for a lot of people. Me, it kind of helped me manage what I call situations and not go off the deep end. But it never really helped me grow. It never really helped me get anywhere with what I wanted to get, which was, of course, women, just more confidence um, and feeling those types of things and feeling worthy. You know, they, they gave me good ideas and just told me, oh, it'll get better in, in college. Oh, it'll get better once you're over being in college. Um, but it just got more painful. So eventually I found, uh, I did find um, the old pickup artist community, which if you guys don't know what that is, that's- I wanna ask a quick, a quick question. Yeah. You were in high school and you had no dating life. How much were, were the stories and beliefs, did you, how much did your disability play into the belief that you couldn't get a girl? Did that play in at all? Um, I think a little bit, yeah. Actually, for sure it did. Because I definitely, when I would very rarely run into somebody my age, um, even people, I guess even people in my high school that were disabled, like to be quite honest with you, I was even like, that's unattractive. Like I, and then I projected that onto myself. I'm like, well, you, you're kind of turned off by this person in a wheelchair or this person with a limp. So why you're not attractive either. Um, although I did have like women, older women telling me, oh, you're so attractive. How do you not have a girlfriend? But it didn't do anything for me because of how I felt about it deep down and not feeling like I felt like I was missing that part of the brain also with women. It's huge, man. It's, it's, it's definitely huge because the, uh, because I grew up uh, similar in, in the sense that I didn't have a disability, but I, I could not believe that a girl would like me. Yeah. Uh, I felt I was either too, too out of shape, too short, too, I mean, I had every story under the sun. When I look back at the pictures, I was fine, but I projected all this onto me and my negative self-talk and yeah. played out exactly 100% to my negative self-talk. And- There's even like a popular girl in my high school, um, and she at one one day I still remember she like grabbed my phone in class and she put her name in as sexy Emily her last name and like I thought that was funny but there was no way never for like eight years until maybe a few years ago or something like that never did I think because her, her number is still in my phone um, I I didn't think oh she wants you to text her or she wants you to hang out there's no way she's the popular girl. So uh, it was that bad that a girl put her number in as sexy Emily and there was no way I was going to do anything with it. That's funny. I had a similar experience. I was sitting in class one day in junior high and I was super shy, super quiet. I wouldn't talk to anybody. If I, somebody didn't know talk to me, I'd get nervous because I was so introverted, especially a girl or a cute girl. And this girl, I, I can barely remember, was sitting next to me in this class. She looked over at me and said, oh, I don't remember the exact words, but she said, you know, you don't have a girlfriend or something. She said, she said, she said, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll make you my boyfriend or something like that. Or, and she smiled and was started. And I, at the time I thought she, my mind went, she's fucking with me. Yeah. Just exactly. And I got really nervous. And as soon as class ended, I took off out the door in like a hundred miles an hour so that she couldn't talk to me. And when I got away from her, I'm like, what was all that anxiety and fear? Why did I have to run away from her? Why couldn't I banter back with her, tease back with her? I, it was just like, it, it was it was almost like torture for me to even be in the room at that point. Yeah. So, so yeah. I don't know what it was like for you, but that's what it felt like for me. Yeah, I mean, just a lot of, you know, I think the, the opportunities were limited because of how I was being with people, just such a nice guy. But even even in that case, again, there were these little opportunities that came up, yeah. um, and I would just, my brain would just not even give me any possibility that oh she likes you. There is no way. Yeah, that's that negative. And so a lot of you guys out there probably have this in your life. Write it in the in the chat. Have you ever had uh, experiences like this where? Maybe it's not all girls. Maybe it's a certain type of girl that you really like. And as soon as you meet that type, the story just starts coming up like crazy. Um, and really, so yeah, you're describing my life. Um, because that's what a lot of people uh, actually go through. And 
And then when I look back, I don't know about you, Mike, when I look back on the guy I was in high school, junior high, grade school, he, he wasn't as bad looking as I thought he was in my mind. The image I'd created in my mind versus the images I look back on, I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that guy, you know? And I don't know what you're, what you're yeah. feeling. Um, for me, it was a little different because I did have like, again, so many experiences where like older women or even middle-aged women that I kind of thought were attractive even back then would tell me, oh, you're so, you're so cute. How do you not have a girlfriend? So I, I knew at some level, okay, there are some kind of good looks to work off of. But again, it just didn't matter because as soon as I opened my mouth, it all goes to hell. It all went to hell back then. So. Okay. It's just, so you know, this is, this, listen to this, Mike. Wow. It feels exactly like me. Amazing. Unbelievable. Uh, I, wow. I've run, I run that way. I run away from women too. You guys are describing my life. Yes. I had that. Yes. Oh, I feel, I feel this so much. Yep. Even a recent last, uh, last, as recent as last summer, too many situations, uh, just girls that like me and I have little or no interest. I run away. Definitely went through it a lot, story of my life. So there's, there's more and more just coming up even as I read these. The only thing wrong with me was that I thought there was something wrong with me. That's a great statement. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, that's it actually. I used to have a phobia of talking to beautiful girls. I used to feel like uh, something was stuck in my throat and I didn't know how to talk to them. So it just keeps going on. Um, so just so you know, that's uh, it's, it's yeah. a ton of people out there feeling this. Let's continue on, buddy. Yeah, so, you know, things got pretty darn painful in college. Because in high school, I could kind of, like, logically, like, okay, not everybody's dating. It's, uh, your therapist is telling you you'll be fine in college. It'll be fine. When it wasn't fine in college, and like, like Brian talks about, I'm, I've kind of always, ever since I was able to tell my mom, I'm 18, I'm doing what I want, and I know you won't kick me out of the house, and then obviously going to college, Ever since that point, I've certainly been drawn to like parties and that kind of thing, to put it lightly. Um, so I always put myself in college in good positions. Like I was even in the room freshman year in the dorms during kind of a semi-orgy. But again, I was sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let me ask you a question. Do you think a lot of this, because uh, you love to be in Hollywood, you love to be around the party scene, you love nightclubs, you love... Uh, you know, oh, it's New Year's Eve. I got to find a big party to go to. It's uh, Halloween. I got to find a big, you love throwing parties. Um, you, you're now dating a porn star. You, um, you know, you've done a lot of crazy stuff in your life. Do you think that's a uh, part of you is wanting all of that to, because uh, I know I went through that too. I wanted all that too, especially when I first started dating and I was trying to make up for all the, the parties that I didn't do anything with in high school, all the, all the action I didn't get. I'm just sitting there on the sidelines. Cause I went to parties sometimes, like you said, and I would be on the sidelines. I was too scared to talk to anybody. And so there was a sense of, I got, I, I, I want to, it was like, it was so built up inside me. I had to go recreate it. Is there any of that going on for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I try and keep an eye on it and release on it, but um, there's definitely, some wanting to make up for the past and that kind of thing. Yeah, you've come a lot healthier about it. it used to be, uh, yeah. remember the old you was a little more destructive. You know, yeah. three rock stars and that are all. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Something like that. And now you, you, you eat super healthy, take care of your body, you focus on health first. So that's awesome. That you do that. Yeah. Okay, continue on. Go yeah, forward. so, you know, kind of, especially like that, that orgy that I was on the sidelines for, um, that was definitely a long point. Um, feeling that and just not knowing what to do. And I even had one of the girls who I liked later tell me, she's like, well, grab a spoon next time. That's literally what she said, grab a spoon. But <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to do that, um, you know. And eventually I like ran into- For the guys out there that have no experience and have no idea what she meant, you want to explain that a little bit? I mean, what she meant, like now that I can kind of see it is get in there, go for what you want. Yeah. Um, obviously every situation is different when that kind of sexual scenario, you have to be more direct and like literally go for what you want. And obviously if the girl doesn't like it, then you back off, but, um, yeah, you, know, you can get a serving. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, you see a girl in that situation on that bed that you like, go, go engage her pretty much. Um, but, uh, yeah, my confidence, there's no way I was going to go do that. Um, 
at that point. So eventually I did run into the pickup artist um, society. Um, I never actually read Neil Strauss's book. I, re I went right to Mystery's book, like how to book. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, because of my past and um, just how much of a nice guy I was being, it did help me a little bit. Cause it taught me, oh, oh like teasing is part of flirting. Um, and it showed me some of the areas I was being super needy with women, but with people in general. Um, it's a step and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. A lot of people really love to attack it. I don't think it's the answer for a lot of guys. I think some guys actually get worse when they take that step or they get better in the beginning, then they get worse. Yeah. Um, because in the beginning it's all new and fresh and they're excited and that excitement gets them some results. And then they try to get really analytical with it and they get worse. But, yep. That's yeah. right. That's exactly it. I mean, I wish I'd found someone like you before I found the pickup artist awesome. society because it did help me a little bit, but that was very limited. And there are still things kind of, in the back of my mind sometimes about like oh don't dlv demonstrate lower value all this shit that's actually like just completely operating from insecurity and trying to put a band-aid over the insecurity rather than deal with the insecurity so did you have a routine stack and yes i had a whole routine stack on my on my phone where i would be like okay a1 which is like the opener like and then do this and this and this um and it did help a little bit. You know, it also got me a date with a cute girl in my, in my journalism class. Well, well, that, though, that's the process of taking action, though. You took some yeah. action. Yeah, I did take action. I, did, I definitely took action. Um, but again, when I would actually get on a date with a girl that I halfway liked, again, I still felt like shit deep down, so it didn't go anywhere, which only drove more pain, brought up more pain, it, you know wow, this cute girl liked me and now she just wants to be your friend. Um, so, you know, it only got me so far. It also like, I knew back then, even at my, that level of self-awareness that the more extreme stuff like, um, oh, tell girls about your, your stripper ex-girlfriend. Like, to, so you look cool, like you've dated a stripper. Even though you never have. And yeah. You can't it. Yeah, yeah. Now I could pull that off. Yeah but I wouldn't need to use that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Back then there was no way a girl, a halfway conscious girl was gonna believe the way I was being that I dated a stripper or anything like that. Um, and there was just like a lot of lying and manipulation. Um, so eventually I did find a much better personal development company at that time. It was a lot more uh, genuine. They gave me good beliefs I could have about my disability that it could be a gift um taught me some more real confidence um i started to have a little bit of a dating life so somebody understands somebody asked what's the uh what, what basically uh what word did you use here uh merit to pick up yeah so and because for the people that don't understand because a lot of people don't understand what that was today and it's all um you know, when you think about pickup, it's not about person. The original pickup wasn't about improving your internal state as much as it was doing external things that cool guys walk, talk, and act like a cool guy, yeah. say the exact words a cool guy does, move your hands like a cool guy, stand like a cool guy, and you'll be a cool guy. Fake it till you make it. And Try and, yeah, dressfully, like peacock. Peacock was the big thing, right? So, it's like mystery, everybody, yeah. And so what, whereas there's, the idea is interesting, what it didn't solve was the subcommunication underneath. So I was walking, talking, trying to act cool. And what I looked like was a social robot because underneath I felt so insecure. So it didn't look natural on me. I looked weird. It was like that guy trying to pretend walking down. Yeah, I got my shit together. I'm cool. And then girls could see it a mile away. Unless you were already fairly confident and then you just tried this stuff and then you were like, wow, this is kind of cool because it would work for the fairly confident guys. Yeah. Yeah, which I was not, you know, I went through a whole peacocking phase to um, trying to wear these terrible shirts, like these, you know, shirts basically with like writing on them that would draw attention yeah. to you and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I'll say this one more thing for you guys, it, the fairly confident guys, all I really had to do was take them and shove them into a girl and that would work too. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't really need all that, but they thought they did. Okay, yeah. go for it, I'm sorry to interrupt there. No worries. So I found this better personal development company. And like I said, I kind of started having 
a little bit of a date of a normal dating life. I felt much better than I ever felt in years and years since I basically started caring about girls. Um, but it still felt like grasping at straws. It still felt like I was getting lucky. Um, and most of the girls were not very attractive. It, it was like they were cuter than before, but I was still doing a ton of settling. Um, and it still all felt like getting lucky. And the thing is, they gave me those good beliefs I talked about, that the disability could be a gift, that, that I could, that I was attractive, that, you know, women do like me. But again, when it was like skin deep, if those, if any pressure, if any tension was put on those beliefs, they would crumble. Um, and that's kind of where you, Dave, and then you came in, um, in terms of helping me actually believe that stuff. So, um, yeah, I ran into Dave. You have tons of subcommunication that tells girls what you feel and tons of emotion. And then behind the subcommunication, if we go deeper, layer, a layer deeper is how you, is that literally how you feel that's driving the subcommunication. And, and it's, a, it's not a big thing. It's a bunch of 1%, little tiny changes that cause you to appear like a whole different human being to a woman and then how it causes them to react differently. There are women that date guys with all kinds of disabilities, marry them, have sex with them, fall in love with them. There's YouTube channels now dedicated to, to uh, couples that are, what are they, what are, what's the term for those types of couples? I don't even know. Uh, there's a term for it, interbling, I think it's called, interbling couples, uh, where, the, uh, where one of them's disabled, one of them's not. And, and these, some of these disabled guys have freaking beautiful girlfriends. They're stunners. Like Sean Stevenson's girlfriend was beautiful. This, um, uh, Squirmy and Grubs has a YouTube channel and his girlfriend is a stunner and uh, she's super sweet and they have so much fun together online and so this idea that a disability has to stop you is utterly ridiculous. Yeah yeah and it's definitely you know it's it's gotten to the point where a lot of the time for me more and more it's it's actually becoming a, a weapon if you <laughs> want to put it that way an advantage. I'm curious about those stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean you you guys, I ran into Dave through that other personal development company, and then he he spent a lot of time on the phone with me just challenging my beliefs about women, about life in general. Um, and then he kind of ran, ran into you, got connected with you um, before you guys were even working together. And he, he told me, he's like, this guy is really going to help you with the stuff that the other coaches haven't quite figured out with you. Um, you need to work with him. So the mm -hmm. kind of the rest was history. Yeah, and I remember we met at that Starbucks and kind of went from there uh, when I was in Studio City at that time. And um, yeah, yeah, and you've changed so much since then. Um, so radically, the, the one thing I'll, I'll always remember is how the littlest rejection, the littlest a girl looking at you funny, not calling you back, like taking an hour or two longer to call you back or respond to a text, you would be just losing your mind emotionally, not knowing what to do. What does this mean? This is all wrong. And then you would say stuff like, it's all going to fall apart now, or I can't remember the exact words. And, and we'd get these texts in the middle of the night from you or, or voice texts, and they would be filled with why everything's falling apart now. And, and that was the bulk of the work was changing, getting you to where you didn't get reactive to that stuff. And can you talk about some of that? I mean, that's yeah. the way. I, that's the way I pretty much remember. Can you talk about it? Yeah, you know, um, I just had along with these, you know, down deep bad beliefs about myself. Um, again, nobody. Ha I had never had any masculine figure in my life. Um, had never ha had any masculinity, any grounding. Um, like we talk about being able to actually get aware of your body. Um, and slow down that analytical mind and settle down low in your body and have that sexual energy, have that masculine kind of uh, energy. Um, and so I was all up here, like really like reactive, really super high energy. Um, and so when anything would go bad, it was very, you know, there was a lot of drama too. I was addicted to drama. Um, you know, that's still, there's still little moments of it for sure, but it's come down a lot. Um, so I was just very, like, very anxiety ridden, you know, um, by anything, good or bad. Uh, so you guys really helped me 
get more of a connection to my lower body and to my masculinity and process a lot of that drama, a lot of that reactivity, um, reactivity to everything and being so quick to go off the deep end um, out of my body. Yeah, that reactivity, that drama, we see it in a lot of clients. They come in and they literally, what they're trying to do, you guys will notice this, is that if you're relaxed and calm, you're feeling your whole body and it feels so good. That's why a massage feels so good. If it's done well, it gets you down into your body um, and gets you to relax into it. All the tension starts to leave. But as you get more nervous and you start to tense up little parts of your body because you're nervous, there's a sense of rising. Like you get higher and higher and you start talking from higher in your body and pretty soon you're up here and you're like starting to race and your mind takes off and because the energy is literally rising in your body. And you, you lose uh, awareness of what your, of the feeling states. And that's how we communicate. We communicate through our heart, through a turn, through a grounding, because we feel each other and we enjoy each other. And so as soon as we leave these parts of our bodies, our consciousness, and is all up here thinking about what to do and isn't feeling anything down here anymore, you can't have a real conversation anymore other than to exchange of data. And a girl can't yeah. get to do an uh, exchange of data. A girl's not going to fuck you because you logically convinced her you were sexy. It's just not, doesn't work that way. When was the last time you logically convinced a girl to be attracted to you? It's, it doesn't work that way. She's got to feel you. She's got to feel your turn on your heart. Your, you got to feel you enjoying her. So let's talk about that journey. What was that journey moving from this guy that, that would go into these spins, right? These, these drama spins and starts coming down to his body. Um, it was, you know, it was amazing. It was very hard work at times um, because I did not like being uncomfortable. Um, and you guys asked me to be uncomfortable a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, some of it was slower for sure. Um, the part getting into my body and getting lower in my body, that was really a lot of fun. Like I just started feeling like a completely different human being. I remember, especially after one particular, uh, movement and feeling workshop, just walking around my, our house property here. Um, in Hollywood, and I was like, I just feel like a completely different person. Um, I feel like more of a man. And it, you, you can't really describe it. You have to start feeling it for yourself. Um, but it's a really amazing thing. I felt more mature, you know, again, as we say, more grounded. Um, and just a lot, a lot of the, the model work that we do, you know, standing in front of the models and letting your, kind of letting your shit come up and deal with that with the beautiful woman right in front of you. Um, and then the movement and feeling work was just huge and like shifting who I was being just moment to moment. Um, and yeah, I got, you know, I got pretty good with like, with like Tinder online dating kind of things. And when there were situations out, it was, you know, an easier situation. Like I could tell she was open to me or I, I was already feeling more confident because maybe I'd been on a few dates lately, gotten laid lately. Um, then like just more than ever before, I could have those interactions in person. But I did for a long time avoid what I was alluding to, which is um, the consistent stepping into tension in terms of being able to walk up to any woman without alcohol or any, any perfect situation also, oh, it's not the perfect moment, um, and be able to go connect with her. I definitely avoided that work um, for a while. I remember when we first took you out in DC. That was awesome. Well, I'll never forget that story, the, the girl you started to talk to and you would get nervous. And she liked you, she wanted to talk to you, and you kept trying to bail. And Dave would pick you up and turn you back around and physically put you back in front of her. And then you would have to talk some more and you try to bail and you physically, how many times did that go on? For a while. I mean, at one point he just stood behind me, like stood right behind me so I couldn't move. I couldn't back out because there's this big guy right behind me. So he's um, a pretty good guy. Yeah. 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 That was, that was awesome. I love that. And so this is a lot of how you grew. So um and so then things started to change and um and so continue on what did yeah. you any other, i want to hear more about your successes and, and as yeah. you start to grow what started to change one of the things i do remember though um i wanted to cover this was i remember you had a you grew really fast in the beginning i was working with you yeah you know this instruction and you were growing nicely and then there was this long period where you almost stopped yeah 
like, um, and I remember exactly what I perceived as happening. What I perceived as happening was you did the work, you grew because you were in so much pain. And, yep. and then you got comfortable because you started to get some girls in your life and you started to get some results. Not exactly what you wanted, but it was enough to make me comfortable. And you suddenly stopped all the work because you were comfortable. You weren't yeah. where you wanted to be, but you were comfortable. And that's what most people do in life is they settle with comfortable. They don't settle for, for, they don't, and they don't push themselves to excellence. And then there was a period of time, I don't remember how long it was, where you just were kind of, I was like, okay, he'll come back when he's ready. And then now you're like a fucking machine again of, I want it. I now want to be excellent. I want to go for it. I want to change my life. So let's talk about that journey on up and what started to happen. I yeah. Start- yeah, that's, yeah. Um, so like I was kind of saying, I got, you know, really pretty good with Tinder, pretty good if, while I was out, if there was a perfect situation or if I met a girl through my social circle. Um, but it was still like, you know, way more attractive girls than I had ever, ever dated before. But again, there was that, there was that part of actually being willing to, you know, walk up to a girl without alcohol, without the perfect moment or the perfect situational thing I could say. Um, and, and talk to her without. That's the, big goal. That's the one that's eluding yeah. you. You gotta get that one down. Okay, continue. Yeah, on. and I just wanted that freedom also, because um, I saw you guys um, and you know coaches that were coming on, even a coach that I brought into the company from another personal development company shooting up, and I was just so scared though to do that work. I didn't want to be uncomfortable and go through the rejection. Um, so as you talked about, I kind of you know got I settled with my somewhat comfortable dating life for a while um and there was still again a lot of when things wouldn't go well you know things looked like they were falling apart I wasn't as crazy reactive but it it was still pretty painful and I was still pretty reactive to it yeah so there's that balance between uh I see this guy taking off and I brought him in and I've been here longer and he's gonna pass me up and the pain of and then also the fear of, well, if I go do the work to become who he is, then I have to face my story. I have to face the part of the I'll never be able to do it. The part of me that, that, that I'm going to fail. So what do I do? I'm just going to keep letting them, even though it hurts more, it hurts really bad. I'm going to keep watching them take off and I'll, and I'll dream about taking action and making stuff happen rather than actually doing the work, even though I have the opportunities right in front of me. Because to face it might mean total failure until eventually that pain got so great that you said fuck it i'm willing to face that total failure is that about right yeah that sounds uh spot on you know i started working for you guys doing you know doing some of the helping out with some of the marketing um youtube production that kind of thing um writing uh but so i i watched these guys grow and like i knew it was happening um but i was just so scared of facing the work and facing my shit um, to get the freedom that they had. Um, so I, I watched that for years, honestly. Uh, and I would grow a little bit here and there. I kept growing, but at just a very slow, like comfortable rate, like just barely on the edge of my comfort zone, not willing to really fully step outside it, step into the tension. Um, but then kind of in the last year, year and a half i i was like okay you know you're not getting any younger i'm not old but i could see those years going passing by me where i where i you know didn't make the most of them um and that pain like you said got enough that i finally started you know putting myself out there every night um every day or every night no alcohol of course because when we do when we do the work especially you know do I drink a little bit on my own? A lot less than I used to, actually. A lot less than really any of my non-fearless friends. But yeah, I'll still drink on my own time, but never when I'm actually, you know, okay, I'm here to grow. We definitely don't believe in that because it, it numbs you out, which is what I had done in the past. Um, so giving that up was hard too, um, being willing to fully face those emotions. But like I said, in the last year, year and a half, I was like, fuck it, it's time, you know, 
you need to make the most, you want to make the most of your life. You want all this freedom. You actually need to show up and be willing to go through what you need to go through. Um, and one of the big, the big, the, one of the big little moments as I, as I call it was, you know, kind of walking around um, bars with also with, I don't have it on right now. I think it's somewhere over there, but um, we give out swag for every workshop that you that you go through as a student um so the one for releasing the emotional emotional work that we do um is a is a chain that says uh courage acceptance peace which is the top of the ag flap cap emotional scale that we talk about and then fearless on one side too and so i'd have that you know literally hitting my chest um because it's a chain uh and so i you know i would feel that and that would help me check in with myself and I started asking myself I'm like okay well are you making it you're scared to approach this girl she's intimidating you think she's too hot or too edgy for you you know I really wanted an edgy girlfriend but was too afraid of them um so I I would start asking myself are you making it about this girl and not getting rejected or getting her or are you making it about your growth and who you want to be as a man and when I started asking myself and feeling into those things in the moment in myself, it helped me move forward and start to talk to girls and um, a lot more, you know, start to talk to all the girls that I wanted to in the bar. And um, that definitely led to, you know, the woman that I'm dating now. Nice, nice. So that's awesome. So let's hear, let's hear some of your stories about that. Cause you, you just told us an amazing story about how you, 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 you really stepped into your willingness to fail. And that's the biggest fear that everybody has. It's this willingness to fail and to actually see the darkest part of themselves, their shadow, the part they're most afraid to see. And you were saying to yourself, you know, uh, up until then you were three feet from gold. You were staying three feet from gold. I'm not gonna cross this because that three feet is gonna determine my whole future. That three feet is gonna determine who I'm gonna become as a man and what my future is gonna be like. And I'm scared to find out that answer. And then you finally reached a point where you're like, fuck it, I wanna find out the answer. Um, because I don't want to go to the grave. It's ultimately what's, what's going on. I don't want to go to the grave as I'm getting older, not knowing. I can face what's on the other side of that, but I can't go to the, but to go to the grave, not knowing has got to be the worst experience ever. Yeah. So I, this, a lot of this relates to me too. And so you did it. And so what started to happen when you started to face that, when you stepped into that, 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 that scariest part, like you're, you're facing your deep, darkest demons now, right? So what happened? Some amazing things. Um, like, and I did have flashes of it before that. Um, like during one program I was taking with you, I think it was a three month program um, or maybe it was a six month program we had, but I was out uh, on Valentine's day with two other fearless guys, um, Brexit, who, James, and uh, Nit Nitsan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and who and else was it you said? Nitsan. Um, he was going out with us a lot too. He's got, uh, he's got hearing aids. He's got a little disability. Too. Yeah, yeah. He's working with, with limitations himself. Um, James and I were in the, in the class together. So we were out doing homework and then it's on with all often tag along to work on it as well. Um, and I walked into this bar in Hollywood, this piano bar that unfortunately now has got ripped down for a hotel, but, um, that was a great place. Yeah. Yeah. I immediately like, saw this black girl and i i love my black women i love a lot of different types of women but those are the ones that i'm most drawn to and anyone who knows me it's we all we laugh about it a lot because it's and it, it, like it's an extreme draw for me um so i saw this cute little black girl sitting with her friend talking and i was like wow she's she's got to be the cutest girl in the bar um didn't go up right away because i could tell they were like having a very intense conversation about something but I, um, I went and posted up on this railing nearby um, and just started to kind of, okay, ground, feel your feet, feel the environment, even take her, like look over and take her in, like allow myself to kind of get turned on and feel it. Um, and then I turned away and turned back and the friend's gone all of a sudden. And I was like, shit, well, you got to go now because the friend could come up, come back. Maybe they're about to leave. You, you got to go now. So I took a moment again to reground, feel my feet, feel my socks, my shoes on the floor. Um, 
and also let myself feel a little bit of the anxiety. Take her in, I get turned on again, and then I, I was like, okay, it's time to go. And so I walked up right to her, and the magic word was hello. Um, <laughs> You know, it was You're looking for the, the perfect set of words. Yeah, um, yeah. literally, it was over at hello. It was game over because I didn't try and say hello a certain way, but how I was feeling from that embodiment work and that feeling work, the hello almost hit her like a wave and almost knocked her off her chair. And she was like, "Who? Like, hello? Who are you?" And then, um, literally, I think ten minutes later. We were making out at the in the bar with her friend sitting right there um and honestly that was me moving slowly because i was still again feeling a lot of nervousness feeling a lot of anxiety but even even that with all the work i had done and knowing that i need to lead things where i wanted to go um i was making out with this beautiful girl on valentine's day in the bar her friend right there her friend liking me um and uh yeah then you know like i even saw her the next night which i was like shit the pickup artists and people say not to contact the girl too quickly don't do that you'll look needy and i was like no the thing is what would a con as you as you taught me what would a confident guy do a confident guy would do what he wants um so we went out the next night and she stayed over um even when she said she like, no, we're, I'm absolutely not coming home with you. All this stuff. Um, stayed for a while. And she actually was talking. She was pretty quickly, like, talking to her grandmother, who was, like, her mom, about me, that I might be the one. Um, which was crazy. That having this beautiful, this sexy little thing walking around my room, half naked, most of the time, um, telling your family about me. But I had some bigger plans. Um, you know, I kind of wanted a very sexual, poly kind of lifestyle. So um, that was actually a powerful moment for me because I kind of broke her heart a little bit in that I wouldn't commit. Um, or at least I wouldn't commit in the way that she wanted me to, to commit monogamously. Um, so you basically, or, you, know, you, you said that quick, you, you, wanted a, you want an open relationship, a polyamorous relationship? Yeah, some kind of open relationship correct seeing other people yeah yeah i wanted her to be my life for sure and be a real you part be of my girlfriend, life. you wanted to, to set you wanted to be honest with her and set the the that we're gonna have an open relationship uh, if we're gonna yeah be. yeah um and that wasn't gonna work for her and that was a very powerful moment in my life like the previous mike would have been like hell yes be my girlfriend and here's a ring like you, you finally got a hot one who's cool done let's call it a life um, but I knew that I had more growth in me and that for me, that wasn't what I really, really wanted. So I was like, yeah, you know, I, I'm sorry. I care about you, but let, let me ask you, can you, it's a little speculation, but do you think if you had got with her and gave her what she wanted, what do you think your life would have been like? How would you have felt six months down the road, a year down the road? Yeah, I'm guessing things probably would have fallen apart. Um, and I wouldn't have felt great about myself like settling and not going after what I fully wanted. Yeah, so you weren't living your truth in that sense. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't have done releasing on being in a committed relationship, had an amazing, I believe in committed relationships, but if you, again, do you even want to? You've got to decide yeah. what you want to go for that. So. Yeah. So, you know, that was a really powerful moment as a man being like, I really like this girl. She's hot, she's cool, but I'm going to continue my path. Um, and then I had, you know, a lot of, crazy other experiences like um you know again i do put myself in a lot of situations that are beneficial i put myself where the women are for sure um and that's part of this house honestly um this house that i live in in hollywood is kind of a crazy place it's settled down a little bit but there are a lot of people rolling in and out of of the house that i put myself in um and there was once you know one day uh, a roommate uh, hit me up and he uh, he said, you know, Mike, come out. Like, there's a, a naked girl by the pool, which actually wasn't a new thing, you know, because he, he does know a lot of, again, we're in Hollywood. He knows a lot of crazy people. 
Um, and, you know, so I came out, I met the girl, um, and we hung out the whole day. Um, she was, a, she was actually a dancer. She, she stripped, um, and like hung out the whole day, came back to my room late, late that night. And it was funny. This was actually a really vulnerable moment for me because she was kind of like, uh, you know, she had a lot going on in her head and she's like, should we go out and hang out with your friends again? Um, cause she, she wanted to be there with me, but she didn't, she had a lot of stories going on. Um, herself and we got to, we were talking about it and I even told her at one point you know even if nothing happens I'm having a great time with you um, you know and and there was a moment where I realized I really wanted her validation and of course this is something the pickup artists and really most dating experts that I've seen would, t would not tell you to say but something told me just be real with her. You're learning to be real. Be real with her. And I was like, I forget exactly how it came up, but I just told her, I was like, yeah, I guess there's, you know, there's part of me that wants your validation right now. I admitted that to her. Um, 10 minutes later, we're in the jacuzzi fucking. Um, <laughs> so it was really vulnerable for me to share that with her, but I think that's definitely part of what like opened her up to, wow, this guy is really, really cool. Um, so those moments of vulnerability, just really, really powerful. Well, vulnerability is one of the big keys. And for those of you guys that aren't on the, uh, well, no, you can't see them. I'm sorry, guys. Um, there's a uh, vulnerability calls with Eddie Brick because he loves vulnerability. And we teach vulnerability big time because it's so powerful when you, when you own it. And he does those on the private secret Facebook page with guys who've done programs. But what I want to do is have Eddie do a few calls, maybe within the series or separately to the YouTube page, because he, uh, he, he loves talking. So good at it. He's married now with a beautiful woman, but it's his favorite topic. So we'll get, we'll get Eddie to teach you a little bit about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was that story. There was another girl um, that I met kind of from being around this house. Uh, who I was actually in Vegas um, last year for um, the AVN porn convention, um, which, you know, I've been to before. Um, this is basically, uh, AVN is like the biggest porn convention of the year. It's where all the porn stars come together to get their awards, like the Oscars. And they, they are, they're all hanging out all day in the bar. And it's usually done at the Hard Rock Casino, which just got torn down. It's going to be the Virgin Casino soon. So guys, you know, a bunch of fans descend on this place like crazy to try to meet these porn stars. So their defenses are up actually pretty high. So continue on. Yeah, and it was still in a period where I had just, I think it was last year, right? Yeah, I had just kind of started to really step into that tension of approaching more, way more often. And when I, when I was really uncomfortable doing it, doing it anyway. Um, so I was, you know, I was using the, the convention is an opportunity to talk to these girls um, and try and approach them. It, you know, I was having a lot of fear and resistance coming up. Um, but, you know, I was on my social media posting to my Instagram and this girl happened to see that I was in Vegas and um, she hit me up. She's like, how long are you going to be there? Um, and then she sent, she's like, I might come out and play. Um, and we'd, we'd, we'd kind of made out a little bit here when she was staying here for a while, but nothing really crazy had happened. Um, she slept in my bed, but she wouldn't really let me get anywhere. And she was playing a funny, a funny game, and I probably also wasn't quite leading enough. Um, but uh, she hit me up and she's like, "I might come out and play." I'm like, "Sure, come out." So um, then she sends me a photo of her and a friend uh, naked together making out, and she's like, "Can I bring my friend?" Uh, absolutely. So, um, it was funny because I was staying with actually Jonathan, Jonathan at the time, um, at, across from the Hard Rock where the convention was. I booked a room. I booked another room with one bed, um, at a hotel nearby. I think it was like, the Flamingo or something, something like that. Um, and, uh, got the room. Getting away from Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I need I 
I needed to see if I could make this uh, make this three way happen because that was definitely on the bucket list too. Um, that didn't quite happen, but what did happen was kind of amazing. So they came, um, and once they came in, the, they'd actually they were taking forever to get here because they left LA to drive to Vegas at like nine or ten at night. Um, and I was like, well, you're not going to sit in the room and wait for them. That's super needy. Go out and have a good time, you know, go on with your Vegas trip. And so they actually were back in the room. And then when I came back, um, the first thing that happened was like, we just all sat on the floor and I, I don't even know how this really happened, but the girl, the main girl that I knew, um, just started a three-way makeout and I made out with both of them at the same time. Um, like all mouths everywhere, um, which was pretty amazing. Um, and then basically we spent the whole night like kind of um, just screwing around. And to be honest, we were, we were naked from like 3 a.m. to like noon and then went, went to bed at like 10 or noon the next day. Um, and it was just kind of one of those crazy Vegas nights. Like, again, just to be, be 100 with people, Sex didn't actually happen, but like a lot of a lot of fooling around, a lot of tits in my mouth, all that kind of stuff happened, and it was just like it was honestly one of the most amazing nights of my life um, so far. So um, just and then and then of course because again you do have to realize if you like the party, the party girls, that's gonna come with drama. So next the next day they had a bunch of drama. Um, the two of them together and they actually like left town. So I had to deal with a lot of drama in that too. But um, that first night was amazing. One of my best nights ever. Um, and I just couldn't really believe it was even happening. Nice, nice. Congratulations, man. Yeah, That's amazing stuff. Um, and that's the stuff that a lot of guys dream of. And, and for those of you on the call that came in late, Mike, uh, you know, Mike's overcome a lot in his life and, uh, and a lot of guys have so many excuses as to why they can't even get one girl. And here you are fooling around with two girls all night long. And, uh, yeah. and reality shifted Matt massively. So what's, the, what's next? Continue on with your story. What, what happened next? Well, another, another piece of it that was kind of already intermittently woven in there was uh, the swinger scene. So we talked about, you know, that I wanted to have a sexually open lifestyle. Um, and certainly Chris Alvino, who was an old student of yours, who I was actually in a lot of classes with, he'd gone very, um, he'd, he'd become a swinger, a bit of a swinger king, I think we called him. So he kind of, he kind of served as a model for me, like, that, wow, you can actually do this. Um, so I'd started going to um, some swinger parties. Now, a lot of them are, you have to bring a girl, which makes a lot of sense, right? Um, so to kind of just initiate myself into this lifestyle so that when I bring a girl myself, like a girlfriend into the lifestyle that I'm more grounded and comfortable in the environment. I actually took a female friend who's one of my, who's a stylist that I worked with sometimes in Hollywood. Um, that I, I met her years ago and she gave me- That was the one where you said, I want to go to a porn a swingers party. I want to go to a swingers party. I want to go to a swingers party, but you wouldn't go. So we set a drop dead day. You got to go to a swingers party by this day or something was going to yeah, happen. Yeah, no, it was during the six month program. Um, it was, you either go to the swingers party or you get kicked out of the program. <laughs> so I eventually, there was one day where you're like, you're buying the ticket at break. You're putting it off, huh? Yeah. You told me you're buying this ticket at break. And Chris Alvino is in the room. So he's like, just help him buy the ticket. You're buying this ticket at break and you're figuring out a way to get there. So, um, so my way to get there. We talk yeah. about the function all the time. Go, go for it. Yeah. So I, you know, I brought this, this cute stylist friend of mine um, into the situation and got, it wasn't, it was also watered down. Like the hotel messed up some stuff and had some public guests in the hotel. So they couldn't, we couldn't go completely crazy, um, which was maybe a good thing because I got initiated into the scene, meeting people um, more comfortable in the environment um, and that kind of thing. And, you know, that was my initiation was, was it was like, it was like a more risque 
dance club was what it was. And then we did go to, back to someone's room, but my stylist friend wasn't, wasn't comfortable with the guy. Um, so we didn't really do anything. Um, but from there, I kind of got, started researching um, the lifestyle a little more in LA and it's big here, um, the swing scene. One of our other clients, um, I'll leave his name out, uh, found a swingers party that guys could go to um, as single guys and just kind of pay double what the couples pay. So I was like, okay. So I started um, going to those um, definitely. And this was like, they call it a swingers party. It's more of a sex party, if I'm being honest. Like it's more, it's definitely like the extreme version where you walk into a room and there's a couple or two couples on a bed um, fucking and everybody else is kind of standing around. A lot of the guys are even, like it gets very extreme. If it's not, if, if you're not comfortable with a lot of dicks, it's maybe not the kind of party for you to be quite honest. Um, but it was like, it was definitely triggering the first time or two, like, oh my God, what kind of environment am I in? And I still did have a feeling because of all the anxiety of like, how do I, like that girl said in college, grab a spoon. Um, but I slowly started like, like exploring a little bit more. And one party I was at, um, I mean, there were some girls who just liked me who like, were like, yeah, hey, what's up? Why aren't you over here? And so they would make it a little easier. Um, and there was one time I found a room and of course, you know, saw this black girl with her boyfriend and, um, they were kind of finishing up what they call a scene or a session, whatever. Um, and she got up and was getting dressed right next to me. I hadn't really said anything to her. So I was like, I was also told by some people, you know, give people space after they finish up what they're doing. You don't want to immediately go try and for it with them, you want to give them some cooling off space um, before you go try and engage them in a, in a flirty or sexual manner. Um, so I was kind of like, hadn't really said anything to her. Um, and she looks over and she's like, oh, hello. I didn't see you over there. And um, she's, she left the room, but she's like, uh, I guess she hugged me and she's like, I'll be back for you. Um, this really, really cute black girl. And so, you know, there are a lot of rooms in the house didn't see her for a while. Then I walked into one room later on and there she was on the bed. And she's like, she's like, okay, come here. And then it was on from there. Um, and I didn't know how I would do. Cause again, there were a lot of people in the room and I had sex with one or two girls at these parties before, but it was on an off night when not that many people were there. Um, much slower, like more, um, lower energy. And in this room, there were a lot of people. So I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. But, um, you know, I was more, I was pretty well focused on how cute this girl was and didn't have any problems. So I, you know, um, I had sex with her in front of like eight or 10 people, um, which was an amazing, uh, an amazing, amazing experience. And I, there's still part of me, there's like that little old part of me that's like, is this really real? Even as I say it, um, because it's just so outside the, the high school and college mics. Um, and even after, after college mics reality, um, that I'm really saying this stuff. So, yeah. yeah it's, it's, a, it's, people don't realize because, uh, um, I played with the swinger scene many years ago for a bit. And, um, and the first time I had sex was actually at a huge party in front of a bunch of people. Um, was that the first time? might have been the first time and then uh yeah there's a whole bit of nervousness and it's very easy for a guy to junk just to stop working and all these things to come up because everybody's sitting yeah. there then once you relax and get, get over it you're like oh this is no big deal yeah uh, and and it really isn't so um so congratulations man that's great for, that's your goal in life so for those of you out there that, that don't care about this stuff this isn't your goal for those of you that do you know mike's out here going for his dreams and he's making it happen so Continue yeah. On. yeah, so that experience has happened. Um, I'm trying to think any others. There, there are a fair, a fair number. I know there's a lot of stories you've got. Um, 
And so for time's sake, we're, we're over an hour now. Let's, let's start moving forward to your current girlfriend because, uh, or because you, you met her at the last AVN, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, then went again this year to, to AVN. And if you guys also, if you guys haven't been to a porn convention, even if you think you're good with sex, because, you know, we talk and teach a lot about sexual shame and I kind of was like, well, I'm pretty comfortable sexually at this point. I don't think I have any sexual shame. The first time, and even even this last time this year, when I went to the porn convention, every time I walk in that room, I'm like, oh, there's sexual shame. I feel it. I feel uncomfortable. With, even though all these beautiful girls are wearing almost nothing, are being pretty friendly for the most part, like welcoming. That's That's how they make their fan bases, is going to these things and meeting the fans, signing autographs, that kind of thing. Um, I still was like, oh, shit, I'm kind of uncomfortable with all, all these women and all these sexual toys that are around, too. Um, so that's a great experience that I highly encourage you guys um, to think about, you know, going into yourself and noticing what comes up and just sitting with those feelings. Now, how do you, how do you balance that with the idea? Because we talk to clients a lot about not getting not – not getting addicted to porn and watching porn all day and then never going out and meeting real girls. We want you to get out and meet real girls. If you want a girlfriend, you need to go not meet girls at the porn convention. If you want to, if you want to have a wilder life, you go to, in the porn convention. So it might be a place to meet girls, but you got to remember they're going to be, their game face is going to be on. They're going to be, they're wilder girls, but they're, they're there to get their fan base built up. So how do you balance that whole, I'm not going to get addicted to porn. I want to meet real girls with the porn convention and all that stuff that goes on. Yeah. Well, I rarely, because of that, and also because it's just such a time suck, very quickly, porn becomes a time suck. I think most of us have experienced that. Um, I don't really watch porn that often. Like, I don't know any of these girls, except for maybe a couple old, older, middle-aged ones from, like, back on, on HBO shows that I used to watch. I don't really watch, watch any porn. I'm not really going because I want to meet it, like, I want to meet this star that I saw on, on a porn. Um, I'm going to face that sexual shame and process that. And also meet these sexual girls for sure. Um, but I think even for someone who just wants a much more standard, you know, normal um, girlfriend and normal relationship, I still think it's a great experience because emotions are going to come up and feelings are going to come up from being in that environment, that if you sit with them and you use um, kind of these grounding and releasing tools that we teach um, or similar tools uh, to process those emotions around sex, that's going to make you that much better for any girl, um, in my opinion. So yeah, it's awesome. a great experience for everyone. Okay, so we still continue on. You get to uh, yeah. the, which was this last one that went on. So yeah, you know, I started approaching um, girls much more by this year, like much, much more. Um, that really wasn't an issue to at least go up and talk to a lot of these girls. They're still resistant. How, how are you going up to approach these girls at a porn convention? So I'm sure this question is coming from a lot of the guys. Yeah. Um, uh, it's usually I'm very direct. Usually I'm, I, again, kind of like I talked about in the piano bar with that girl on Valentine's Day, take them in, let myself get turned on, even feel the nervousness feel my grounding, my lower body, um, and go up and just talk to them. Um, are some going to be closed off because they are there working? Absolutely. You know, I have to be willing to be rejected. And sometimes I notice myself not willing to be rejected in those environments. But I was stepping into it way more than ever before. Um, so I'll just walk up, kind of look at them, and tell them what I think about them. Um, tell them, damn, you're fucking, sec fucking sexy, or whatever. Um, again, though, it's not the words. It's really dropping into that turn on, looking at them deep in the eye and saying, hello, you know, hmm. damn, Good. you're sexy. And again, that's not perfect because I don't have a sexy woman right in front of me, but slowing yourself down and really feeling her and feeling your attraction for her. Um, so I was going around doing that. Um, met actually a couple girls. One of the other girls, um, she, uh, she, like, the first time I went, went up to talk to her, kind of more businessy. Then I went up again and talked to her a little more open um, this time. 
And I just started shutting up, slowing my words down, and just looking at her in the eye. And at one point, I just looked at, looked deep into her eyes, just like we do with the model work, and just sat there with her, and she's like, you're making me nervous. And I'm like, you're making me nervous, too. And I told her how, you know, sexy she I thought she was. And from there, completely open, was actually kind of making a scene at one point. Um, when she found me somewhere else, there were a bunch of guys walking by. She's, like, hanging all over me, telling me she wants to, like, she wants to kiss me so badly, but she can't at the convention. And like guys are like looking like, what is going on? Who is this guy? Um, so met her, um, nothing ended up happening with her, but right after I met her and had this experience where she's throwing herself all over me, um, I was kind of, I think it was the last day of the convention or maybe before, but I, I went up and um, saw this other woman at this um at this cam girl table um and there was a moment again where i was like yeah i don't really want to i'm feeling resistance feeling fear but i was like come on fuck it you gotta say fuck it and step into who you want to be um so again took her in a little bit and you know did the same type of thing where i'm just kind of there with her feeling her telling her what i think of her and letting her feel that through my eyes um, and she actually, she pretty quickly like pulled out a business card and then my heart kind of drops. I'm like, oh, she's just looking at me as a customer. And so she gave me her business card, but I like, I did hit her up to see what would happen. And I still, from some of the responses, I was still like, I don't know, is this girl trying to make me just a fan? But um, I eventually went for the date. She said yes. Um, and there was still like a lot of me not believing that she was going to show up or what was going to happen on the date. And then I, um, I met her at, at the Cosmopolitan, um, the hotel, a hotel on the strip. And it was just cake from there. Um, she like literally said hello by kissing me on the lips. Um, so I was like, okay, this is probably going to go pretty well. Um, there was a, uh, there was a, a still a lot of tension that came up because there were still moments of me going in my head like I'm sitting next to this porn star and she's telling me about she's or she's told me about how some fans are like coming up to her and asking her for this asking her if they can take her out to dinner all this stuff she has fans like I'm sitting next to this porn star um so there was part of me that was still like might have even let it go friend zone because of all the fear. But I was like, no, you're not doing this. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of, there was some pushing on that date to like make myself show up as the guy that I'm trying to be. Um, but I led, you know, I, I grabbed her hand pretty quickly while we were sitting at this one bar and put it on my, put it on my leg, um, very receptive. And then uh, we went to another bar that was kind of hidden that a friend had, had given me like where you walk through this, this food court and there's a hidden bar that you go into through a door that looks like it's the trash chute. So we went there and we were sitting and then eventually I just, again, shut up and just looked at her and she's like, what are you thinking? And I, I'm like, I'm thinking I want to kiss you. And um, pulled her in pretty easily um, and kissed her. And then, you know, a few minutes later, I was like, do you want to get out of here? And she was like, yeah. And like, like she'd been waiting for me to ask. You know, um, so she came over. Uh, I actually had to book another room because I was saying, I just saw some comments from Anthony. I was staying with Anthony and Anthony was going to bed. So I had to book another room and step through all this another tension level where I brought her into the lobby. And I had to book another room with her like here like and deal with that. And I was like, oh, I set this up. I didn't set this up well. Like this is so awkward, you know, all this stuff. Um, but still, I, you know, I worked my way through it emotionally. Um, and then she came back to the room. We had sex, um, which was amazing. Like, I had to catch myself sometimes being like, wow, this is actually happening right now. Um, right. And then the next day, she, she told me, she's like, you know, we talked about maybe seeing each other again. And she told me, she's like, you know, I would like to come to L.A. if, if you're okay with it. Um, and I was like, absolutely. Or 
what another thing on my bucket list that I'd never done was uh, have was go on a Vegas trip with a girl. Like I'd always done party trips or trips with friends, but never been dating a girl in Vegas, which I always kind of wanted to do. The romantic part of me wants to have this romantic adventures together with girls. So I told her, or we could go to Vegas and do a couples, a cute little couples trip. And she was totally down. So we, we did that. And yeah, she wasn't from Vegas, right? No, she's from, uh, she lives in Texas. Okay. So, um, yeah, our second date was three days long and it went, it went great. Um, yeah. I remember seeing this clip of you pouring champagne all over her body, I think. And yeah, she, you know, again, she is, she is still working um, in porn. So she set up, I told her that I want, I bought her that like this candy bra that I wanted to eat off her and got some champagne and she was totally down. Um, and so she got in the bathtub because I was just going to do it on the bed. She's like, are you fucking kidding me? We're not using the bed. Um, we're not pouring champagne on the bed. Um, so she gets in the, in the, in the, in the bathtub, um, set up her phone and I could see, I'm like, okay, so my hand's going to be on the internet, I guess, but I could see that my face wasn't going to be in there. Um, and so, yeah, just, she had this candy bra on and poured, uh, popped a bottle of champagne, poured it all over her. Um, and that video is on her Twitter. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just another crazy three days so yeah. so you're continuing to see her right you guys are still in contact yeah unfortunately you know she was supposed to she was supposed to be here this week or next week um unfortunately you know since she's in texas and we're we're in this time she's also on the weekends she's actually a nurse so she's uh working in the hospitals a lot right now obviously with the coronavirus so she can't really come see me unfortunately right now but we're talking, you know, almost every day and hopefully going to see her as soon as we can travel safely. Now, this is beautiful because you're her, she's doing all this giving work. She's helping all these people. She's working her ass off and you're her grounding element. You're yeah. the one that probably brings her down at the end of her day so that she can go out and do it the next day. So trust me, that's all going to, that's going to come back after all this is over. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful place to be. Uh, congratulations, Mike. Um, well, we're an hour and 17 minutes in, uh, what I want to do really quick, is there anything else you want to tell everybody? Because these are amazing stories and you've radically shifted your life. And, and, uh, and for those of you that, that maybe tuned in later that you got to realize, you know, Mike started out really insecure. Uh, he does have a disability. You can't see it on camera, but he's got a, he had a stroke and, um, with him sitting there. So you've got a limp and you've got an arm that does, it's a little, doesn't work very well. Right. And so you guys, and the reason I bring this up is so many of you guys think something's like I did. I used to think, oh, my, I'm losing some hair up here. Well, how can girls like me? Oh, I'm not tall enough. I'm only 5'8". Why would girls like me? And actually, how tall are you, Mike? You're a little shorter than me. You're 5'7". Uh, yeah, 5'7". On a good day. And so I had all these stories. And, and then you look at somebody like Mike killing it right now. And your stories don't mean shit, guys. Like, let it all go. Uh, Eddie was amazing with women until he got married, and he's still amazing at, on the calls. And he's five two; he would kill it. So don't don't let your story stop you. And that's why Mike's here to show you. You got you got to go through tons of like he went through tons of breakdown of breakthroughs and terror barriers along the way. You got all these reasons you weren't going to succeed, and as you're going through each one, repair your life is different now. Yeah, yeah, completely, oh, completely different life, completely different human being. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so let's take a few questions and then we'll, we'll to end the day out, uh, close it up. Um, and uh, let's. We're not going to do the morning routine today. Whoever wrote that, because that's not the subject. But uh, we'll, we'll, I do want to get to a call around that at some point. Um, uh, we'll go with this one. How do you have more self-worth? Um, how to give more priority to my needs over others uh, so I don't care to be nice to them? And it's, you can care to be nice to people, but and that's the first thing I'm gonna say, don't think you can't care to be nice to people, you shouldn't be nice to people. It's the, it's the I have to be nice to people or I'm a bad person is what you wanna get rid of. Go, go ahead, you wanna say something, Mike? Yeah, um, definitely on that last point, just checking in with yourself. Am I, am I doing this? because I'm enjoying just giving 
or do I want something in return? Which we've talked about, I believe, on these webinars a lot. Like, if, if it's giving with any kind of hope, of course, maybe there's always a little something, but if, if there's a pr primary energy of, I'm going to get this back, that's where it's not not giving, not really going to serve you. And in terms of self-worth, yeah, it's just doing a lot of this work. Um, also, another thing I'll recommend for people um, that you had me do that was terrifying at first, I absolutely hated it at first, was taking yourself out on dates. Just like you take a girl out on a date, um, eating it like a real date, going out to dinner, that was the worst one by myself. I had this story from... Yeah, not, not, a, not a cheap restaurant, like a nice restaurant dressed up. Yeah. Um, shave, shower, you know, treat it like a real date. Treat it, treat yourself like you treat women, um, or like you would treat a woman. Uh, and you know, I had this story that it's sad and awkward to eat dinner by yourself at a restaurant, and it was a pretty damn big story. Um, the first, the first couple times I did it, it was, and not be also not be on your phone the whole time, you know, distracting from feeling awkward. Um, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be on your phone the whole time, I hope, on a date. Um, so, you know, leave the phone in the car uh, and just feel all the emotions that come up. Um, and so, you know, doing stuff like that and learning to enjoy it, you know, go from it being painful to actually enjoying time with myself um, was, was big. I got that from David Burns in a book called Feeling Good. First book I ever read on personal growth when I was really young and I started to do it. And one of the things um, he said in that book that I was the reason I did it was the core reason was if you don't enjoy your own company, how can a woman enjoy your company? If you don't like hanging out with you, why should she like hanging out with you? If you won't dress up for you and take care of you and treat you special, why should she, why should she dress up for you and treat you special? Yeah. Those are all really good points. Um, let's go on to the next one. Um, hi, Mike. Uh, hi, Mike and Brian, but I'm going to address this to you because it's a, it's a fun question. How can I change my belief that I have a small penis or a small dick? I can't pursue most beautiful girls. Uh, even um, uh, a small dick, I can't pursue most beautiful girls. So that's the question. Even though no girl I slept with complained about it, uh, many beautiful girls I wish I would sleep with tell me that size does matter for them, which just uh, squeezes me from the inside and I feel I'm not worthy of them. Yeah, well, certainly there are girls that will call themselves size queens. Um, some of the, a few of them are like legit, um, but most of them, again, a girl will have a type, right? Um, that she's like, oh, I like this kind of guy or I want this dick size. But a lot of the time, if you, most of the time, really, if you're showing up in the solid, confident, sexual, you know, grounded guy, that stuff is going to go by the wayside really quickly. Yep. And well, some girls are just saying it to, to, to see how you react, to test you. Yeah. Some girls are actually size queens. Some girls are actually size queens in the reverse. They want smaller penises. There's a lot of those because it hurts them to have bigger penises. Yeah. Um, anything under the sun. I've never had a girl complain about my, my cock size um, ever once. And I used to have that same fear. Never once. Uh, most of our stories about cock size come from watching too much porn, to be honest. We watch all these guys that are hired in porn because they have big dicks, and we think that's the norm. That's not even close to the norm, and girls know that. So that's another one. So, yeah. So, um, so you know. And then I remember, oh, here's a good story. There was this guy. It was, God, this must have been 10 years ago. He, he had a average to smaller cock and he said what I used to do to get myself over it was I go out with girls and I start talking dirty to them right away and as soon as I start talking dirty to them on a date and we start getting turned on I start going oh you know you know my cock's too big right it's too huge oh my god my cock's so huge and I start oh when I put it in you're gonna feel it because it's so big and he starts just teasing them all night long oh you don't even know don't. Say, say, say baby I don't know if I can handle your cock and he'd have him say stuff like that and then he goes and I pull it out it's not big at all they always go because the girls' minds, their fantasy mind is so powerful and they love to play in it. It's not about necessarily the physical literalness. It's about the play and the, and, the, and the fantasy. So he goes, I'll pull it out. And eventually they'll be like, oh God, it's so huge. It's so huge. I, I said, I don't know if I can fit in you. And they'll be like, oh, put a, let's try, baby. Let's try. And he goes, I don't have a big dick at all, but we're playing this whole game out and they love it. And they dance with me and we play and we have fun with it. So... 
so that's a guy who, who just turned it into a game, you know, um, and then got over his own story that way. So um, I'm going to jump past that. And so um, how do you improve? Okay. So you've done a lot of work with this. How do you improve your subcommunication? Like you've done a lot of work with change. Your subcommunication has radically shifted. You used to give so much like reject me subcommunication and your and even the eye contact you just did on the screen earlier where you were like practicing hitting on that girl at AVN was so was pretty damn good. So how does your how did you change all that subcommunication? Yeah, it's doing all this feeling work. Um, you know, stepping into tension like like we've talked about to trigger the emotions and how you really feel about yourself deep down. Also, even if you're not working on women specifically, as long as you're a guy that's into girls, th these situations where you go up to a strange woman that hasn't invited you over and you're trying to connect with her, find out who she is, those are, are the situations that are gonna bring up the most insecurities that you can work with for the rest of your life. But um, in terms of, yeah, subcommunication, it's, um, really like getting out of your head that was so huge for me and like getting a relationship to especially in my lower body um, again the thing I always when I'm working with guys and trying to help, help them ground and the thing that works for me most is like literally um, this is only one level of it but it's a way into your body right is ask yourself how do your how do your socks feel against your feet right now guys even how do your socks feel against your feet right now on this call? How does that feel against your shoes, against the floor underneath you? Like, what does that feel like? And then that starts to get you access to your body, to your lower body, to your grounding. Um, and it's a lot of that work, like raising awareness of your lower body. Um, I'll even, sometimes even for me, like whether I'm in a workshop and I realize that I'm getting a little heady or I'm out and, I, and some anxiety comes up around women or people in general, and I need to feel my lower body and I'm having trouble, I'll literally tap or like massage like the backs of my legs a little bit, um, touch my back, you know, feel my spine. And feeling the back side of your body is especially where your, your masculinity is. And it's also where a lot of grounding comes down um, the back of your body. So that helps me again get back out of my head and come back down into the moment into my body um other things uh that's that's definitely one way um and then why, also why, why is it so important to get into your body how does that affect your subcommunication i'm sure there's some some people asking that question yeah so um when you're all up in your head like thinking really like mostly aware of just your thoughts you're just kind of a different person um you come off as more robotic more like anxiety with you know um just kind of if you picture the way i'll tell people sometimes is picture like a napoleon dynamite or if you haven't seen that movie um just some classic nerd in a tv show or a movie picture him then put him in your mind next to russell brand and without even moving without or maybe they, they're walking next to each other. Can you see how differently they feel just from moving without, without even saying a word? And the difference is, is that the Napoleon Dynamite type person is all up in here. And it's almost like you could almost poke them and they would fall over. Whereas a Russell Brand is like much lower in his body. Um, also, there's a lot of turn on, right? There's a lot of sexuality, but there's more of a sense that he's like lower connected to the ground. I don't know. Does that make, do you think that makes sense for guys? They literally enjoy their whole body more. Russell Brand is amazing at that. He's really good at staying in his turn on and his heart at the same time. So everybody go watch some Russell Brand, watch him flirt, watch him talk, watch him communicate, watch out whether he's polarizing and what, and but particularly don't watch him talk about politics as much yeah. as watch him flirt with the girls. Look up the clips of him flirting with the girls and how he just goes at it. That's all coming from emotion and feeling and turn on and pleasure and not apologizing for himself. So I think it's a great, great example. Um, um, 
Okay, this is a good one. Most beautiful girls respond to me very badly. Uh, they seem to have an attitude. What's your experience talking to such girls who throw a lot of attitude? So how do you deal with those girls that give you shit? Yeah, well, the more you put yourself in those situations and learn to get okay with getting rejected a little bit, because those are the types of girls that I'm drawn to, are very edgy, confident, outgoing, very sexual girls. Um, and there are still times I'll go up and maybe it doesn't go so well, but I'm always learning. I'm always, um, and you have to be willing to like get rejected and even you even have to be willing to feel shitty about it. Um, and then use kind of Brian's releasing tools um, in that moment when you, when you get triggered, when you feel shitty, go take yourself outside or wherever you're at, maybe go in your car or just sit down on a bench if you're outside and process those emotions, do releasing and allowing on those emotions and get free of um, that need for validation and also fear of being invalidated. Um, and the more you get free with them, that's the key. It's not really, yeah, are there conversational techniques you can go try and learn? Sure, but again, like Brian talked about with the subcommunication, those tools are gonna come off really awkward if you're just doing it from a place of, oh, this this tool helps me deal with like girls who are bitchy or girls who are edgy. Um, you're, you're just, they're just gonna like probably laugh at you because they're not gonna believe what you're saying or believe your response to what they're saying. So you really have to allow yourself to get triggered, process those emotions and slowly get free of, of you know, being afraid of their invalidation. Um, and the more you get in your body, the more you'll just be able to banter back and forth with them. Nice, I like the answer. So it's 12.30, what I wanna do is we, got, we don't have that many questions, so I want to uh, left, but I wanna see, can you keep the question, the answer super short under a minute? Imagine we're on a radio show and you're, you got a three minutes and we're gonna be, we're gonna go to commercial, it's gonna be gone. So you gotta go boom, 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 boom. What's, let's put some quick bullet points you can give some of these answers really quick to, to just something, something juicy for each one. Um, um, Hey Mike, you seem to have uh, have uh, like me spent many years with a certain story in mind. What's your advice when dealing with the amounts of pressure that revert you to behaviors? So, uh, example would be uh, so much happens in your life that you revert back to approval seeking because uh, external approval is a quick fix, or with triggers that hit you, the core beliefs that you had uh, so many years ago. So, what do you do? What do you deal with when you get when you revert back? What do you do to get back in your body? How do you deal with that? Two things, releasing on it, allowing and releasing. And at, I asked myself the two, these two questions, which is what would I do if I wasn't afraid? And who do I want to be? And what's one step I can take towards that person? And go that direction. A little better. That, thank you, that was a great answer. Uh, this one's from Daniel. Daniel's always, he's on every call. Love you, Daniel. Uh, another one, when I meditate and imagine a beautiful woman in front of me, I feel my energy almost wants to pull me back away from her. It's not a feeling. I feel it in my body. So uh, it's not a feeling I feel in my body. So um, that's an interesting statement. So where are you feeling it? So what are the ways you explain this feeling as it feels impossible to release on? So it's not a feeling I feel in my body. That's interesting. Because how do you, you can't feel if you don't have a body. So. Yeah, I'm not sure where you're feeling it. Maybe it's all anxiety up here. Um, that's, that is embodiment work, like dropping out of your body, allowing more than releasing, allowing yourself to feel how you feel. And then again, checking in with what do I want? Who do I want to be? How do I step more that direction? And owning, like even owning, hey, I'm, a, I'm like working on my confidence. You make me really nervous, but I'm here to say hi and work yeah. on that kind of thing. Okay, next one, good, good answer. Um, I was gonna say something, I forgot what it is. We're gonna go on. Can we have a call on grounding and dealing with women and challenges? Uh, yeah, at some point, we've done it before. We have other grounding videos out there. So if we can find a grounding video, we can post it in the Facebook page and you can go through it. And it's an actual one where I take you through a practice. So let's find that guys and get that up there if we can. Um, next one is from Rudy. Um, how do you get over the idea that some women are just being used for sex? Don't get me wrong, sex is natural and beautiful thing, 
but there's something about uh, five guys and one girl, for example, that feels weird if you actually care deeply for the woman. That's the belief that women don't love sex as much as we do. Um, I encourage you to read My Secret Garden. Read just 100 pages of that. I didn't even read the whole thing, and you'll see how crazy women are. I've had more than one girl's fantasy be to be with five guys at once. They tell yeah. me that straight out that that's their, that's their fantasy. Um, okay, this is uh, from Grant. I'm 35, never been with a woman, and it's a <clears throat> big insecurity for me. I feel like I should have more experience for my age and that the women expect more out of me. When a woman begins to show interest, I have a huge uh, tendency to run away. Do you have any advice on how I can live in a more, uh, more self-acceptance and just enjoy, uh, enjoy, enjoy where I'm at in life? And by the way, I've had many clients in their 40s and, and, uh, that were virgins too. Go for it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, again, the more you get vulnerable, with with people um with women the better you know it may bring up a lot of emotion at first um but if you just go around just go around saying uh, walking up to women and saying hello saying you know i don't have much experience with women and i'm working on my confidence with them and i think you're really cute i just wanted to say hi and start there um use the tension journal with that google tension journal fearless man and there's an exercise um and just start raising that tension level but being vulnerable and owning that part of yourself. Nice. Um, for you guys out there, just remember for a lot of this stuff too, we have programs if you can get into them. Uh, we're working on online programs for some of it too, but uh, for we have the movement feeling workshops, we have releasing workshops, we have the dating workshops where you actually stand in front of beautiful women and you get to practice this stuff while we give you direct feedback. We even put you on camera and we show you how to meditate and release and process the emotions that come up on camera so your subcommunication changes naturally so if you're interested in anything like that contact your coaches i know somebody put in the comments earlier that they wanted uh, us to put some more information about the programs over here because they were super interested in after watching you mike so uh let's make sure that they, they get those uh get that information you can get you can definitely get it on the website too um okay awesome i think we're going to end it there because we're after 12 37 is there anything you want to say in closing mike because that was a great call you gave a lot of great value i watched you really share a lot of great stuff so so uh, anything you want to say in closing? Yeah, it's just, you know, when you go to work on this stuff, again, ask yourself the question I keep asking myself when I'm scared and don't want to move forward, which is who do I want to be and how important is that um, to me? And what would you do if you were not afraid? That's perfect. Those, let's get those questions up on the secret Facebook page. And, and let's, and for any questions you got for Mike, let's put a little section on the secret Facebook page for this event, for this group, for the closed Facebook page. And you can ask those questions directly to Mike if you didn't get your questions answered and you can answer those questions and talk, start some conversation. Uh, did you want to give out any information for how they can contact you directly or anything like that? Uh, yeah, it's just Mike at the fearlessman.com. And yeah, if you definitely, if you guys didn't get your questions answered here yet, um, we'll put something up in the, group and definitely ask them again and I'll, I'll get to it uh, later today or tonight. Awesome. And uh, with that said, send some love to Mike. I see it's already starting to happen. People are sending, uh, uh, they're really enjoying your, your call. So check the chat out there, Mike. Um, and for those of you that are watching this on Facebook, make sure to put those comments in make sure to like. For those of you that might be seeing a clip of this on YouTube, make sure to like the video. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe, hit that notification button, especially if you got value out of it, man. And share, 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 share. If for anybody you think could use this information, we really appreciate the shares. It, it builds everything up and allows us to bring more content to you. Um, and um, uh, make sure to comment on YouTube too, if I haven't said that. And, uh, and as always remember, um, and as Mike said, what, what would you do if you weren't afraid is, is one we used to use a lot. So, and then I've been saying lately is what would you do if you were fearless? That's another great one. And then our, our the tagline, we put it every video. I'm going to end with this. Uh, love you, Mike. Great call. And remember, what would you do? Uh, oh, I've got them all. I got mixed up in my head now. Yeah. Only the confident really live. Remember, only the confident really live. See you guys in the next video. Take care. Uh, by the way, the next video is tomorrow, and I believe it's on, um, we're going to be talking about quantum physics and changing your subconscious mind, breaking down the movie, What the Bleep, talking more about quantum physics, and I'll be doing that with Sam. So yeah, I know you, all you guys love Sam, so tomorrow's, don't miss tomorrow's call. It starts at 11, be on the call, be ready to go, because it's going to be a deep dive, and it's going to be a lot of fun. 
And uh, you can catch Mike's video over. I saw some of you said you're going to watch Mike's video over and over because you got so much great value out of it. So again, only the confident really live. Take care. See you tomorrow.